Hi, thank you everybody for joining us on the Conscious Life Expo podcast. My name is Melanie and today we have Brad Olson and Brad Olson is a captivating speaker and an award-winning author of 10 books. He is also a book publisher and event producer and has traveled to all seven continents, including Antarctica, seeking the answers to the mysteries of humankind's past. Brad Olson has also been on television shows such as Ancient Aliens, American Unearth, Beyond Belief, Book of Secrets, The Truth is Out There, and Mysteries of the Outdoors. And thank you very much, Brad, for joining us today. And we will be discussing your keynote workshop, which is going to be Sunday, February 11th at 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. And we will also be covering your book, Beyond Esoteric, which is also in the Conscious Life Expo Book Awards. But before we get into that, I would just like to introduce everybody to Brad. And how are you doing today, Brad? Hey, Melanie, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on Conscious Life Expo in TV. Yeah. And great to reach out to all the people that are coming out to the Conscious Life Expo in Los Angeles, second weekend of February. See you there and I'll get a chance to meet you too. So. Yes, yes, wonderful. So your um, workshop is going to be on Giants in Prehistory. And before we really get into that and discuss that, let's talk about you and how you got started along your journey and to where you are now. Sure. Well, as you said briefly in my introduction, I had the great opportunity and honor really to have been able to travel around the world. I've been to all seven continents, including Antarctica by sailboat five years ago. I was just getting down to Ushuaia, South America, and was getting ready to get on a 72-foot sailboat to cross the Drake Passage, which was pretty rough going. It was the hardest trip I've ever taken, and I think I lost about 25 pounds on that trip just because I was uh, seasick for three days and couldn't hold food down. So anybody want the crash course diet, uh, I'll tell you, traveling overseas to Antarctica is the way to do it. <laughs> a little bit uncomfortable. But uh, all the while, traveling around the world has given me a great perspective on so many different cultures and uh, different ways that people live and even these esoteric subjects, which I'm so uh, passionate about and write about in my three series of books in the esoteric series, because many of them have to do with, say, for example, the Great Pyramid, which I did travel books before I got into this series, and I can only really do about a four or five page treatment on, for example, say the Great Pyramid. But there's so much more to that structure that it lended itself to more information that I put in Modern Esoteric, the first book in the series, and then references to others. So really travel has been um, one of my greatest teachers, even though I did get a double major in university. Um, Traveling around the world has just really opened my eyes to so much that um, gave me this perspective on putting these books together and being a, a book publisher and what else to find in other authors who, who have uh, similar information to provide. Wonderful. And what led you to starting your travel and your expeditions? Wow, really just a curiosity for how the world worked. I grew up in uh, suburbs of Chicago, Illinois, and it's pretty flat there. <laughs> We'd go on Boy Scout trips. My dad was one of the scout masters and uh, my older brother and I and younger sister go on family trips. And it just always seemed to me at, 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 as a young age that there, boy, there's such a big world out there. And so as soon as I finished college, I did my first three month solo backpacking trip through Europe. And that's when I met uh, Australians and Kiwis. And they say, three months, mate, we've been on the road for three years. I said, well, how do you do that? He said, well, we work our way around the world. So eventually I would take that advice a couple of years later. And I went to Japan. I was an English teacher for 14 months. And then that uh, 
self-financed all my trips, paid for my uh, additional 18 months on the road. So I was out of the country for about three years in the early 1990s. And as I said, that that has been one of the best uh, life lessons and greater perspectives on how the other half lives so far away around the world. But I'll tell you, people are people everywhere. And it, it's ironic that the poorer that people are, the friendlier and more generous they are. It's kind of funny that way. And uh, I'm about to embark on a trip to Southeast Asia in a couple of weeks, right before the Conscious Life Expo, to the country of Laos, which is one of the poorest countries in Southeast Asia. But I'm going there with the uh, ASEAN Tourism Forum, and I'm going to write a travel article about the Plain of Jars, which is this megalithic site in the middle of Laos. Nobody knows how these huge jars got there or what they're used for, but I'm going there to investigate. And uh, so when I see it, Conscious Life Expo should have a good story to tell you about that land so far away. How fascinating. And so what led you to write your first book? Well, my very first book is called World Stompers, A Global Travel Manifesto. And when I was traveling around the world in the early 1990s, I was just really amazed at how few Americans I'd met. There's a lot of other Europeans, Australian, New Zealanders, as I said, but uh, very few Americans, even more Canadians than Americans. So I thought, boy, if I could just put a book together that would tell everybody the pitfalls and the do's and don'ts and uh, learn the hard way lessons that I learned, uh, that could maybe help provide a template for other Americans to get out there on the road. And that book is still in print. And uh, occasionally I'll get an email from someone who said they read it and put together their own trip around the world. It's basically to prepare people uh, and how they can self-finance their own trip as well. And uh, that led me to then uh, doing some other travel guidebooks. And then my Sacred Places 108 Destination series of books, which also came out uh, in the early 2000s. Right. And then you also have your book here that is going to be at the Conscious Life Expo Book Awards, which we'll also put that link in the description so anybody can go and vote for your book. So tell us about Beyond Esoteric, Escaping Prison Planet. Yeah, that's my latest book. It uh, It is the third in the esoteric book series. Each one is completely unique individual, modern esoteric, pretty much all the secret society. And uh, before that, the mystery schools of old, all the esoteric studies to date, where future esoteric, the unseen realms, concerns itself largely with the UFO and ET enigma, the mysteries of the cosmos, where beyond esoteric takes us to this modern age. And, and in it, we get into a lot of deep subjects, including my uh, information gleaned from the Antarctica trip, including the black goo, which has also been found on an island off of Antarctica, and so much more, including uh, what I'll be speaking on at the Conscious Life Expo uh, with the Giants, our suppressed human origins chapter in Beyond Esoteric. So what led me there is really all of the other nine books before this 10th one was released. And it's been very well received. It's uh, highly rated on Amazon. And uh, I invite your listeners to uh, check it out. And if they like Beyond Esoteric, you can drop a vote for best book of the year. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. And so what can you tell us about these giants that you have learned so much about and the elongated skulls? Well, this is truly a, a fascinating chapter of our history, including how it's been erased from our history. In the United States, we have what's known as Smithsonian Gate, and that is the Smithsonian Institute will go to some of the dig sites I illustrate one particular dig at Lake Delavan in Wisconsin, Southern Wisconsin, not too far away from where I grew up. And I remember growing up going to see the effigy mounds at Devil's Lake and hearing these legends of the giants. 
But in the uh, about a hundred years ago, the archaeologists from Beloit College in Wisconsin were doing a dig at Lake Delavan. They had been tipped off that a farmer had discovered some bones that were very, very large. They're doing everything by the book. The local newspaper started to report on these findings that they had uncovered nine foot, 10 foot giant human skeletons. Well, look, the tallest man ever recorded was Robert Waldo from Alton, Illinois, and he was eight foot 11. And these were coming in bigger than him. So clearly they were human like, but not quite human. And oftentimes they would have these bulbous uh, skulls that that elongated out in the back, much different than ours, and 30% larger eyes and a larger uh, connection to the to the spine. So they're doing this dig, and and the news stories start uh, going from local uh, coverage to then getting on the wire and being covered uh, across the nation. Then as soon as it started to uh, get a lot of attention, here comes the archaeologists, I'll put that in air quotes, from the Smithsonian Institution kind of flashing their badge like the FBI saying, oh, well, we're we're here on the scene. We're going to take over this dig. And they say, oh, well, well, hold on. No, no, we want, we're well into this. We want to complete this project. So no, 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 we're, we're going to do this. The archaeologists from Beloit College said, well, look, we really want to find out more about what you find out if we're going to turn this over to you. And they said, oh, yeah, sure couple weeks go by, a couple months go by, nothing uh, is said to the Beloit College scientists. So they contacted the Smithsonian Institution. They said, well, what'd you find? And they said, we don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> there was no such dig. And so Smithsonian Gate is a concerted effort to just push this history aside. And there's even stories of them taking these giant bones and funerary artifacts really priceless objects, and then just dumping them in the Atlantic Ocean, just out of sight, out of mind. So there, there has been a concerted effort to cover all this up. And I'm just wondering why. Why is it so hard for Smithsonian Institution and, and our historians to understand that there had been giants a long time ago? They're written about in the Bible. Uh, many other ancient texts refer to the giants. And it's just an esoteric subject because so few people know about it. And therefore uh, <laughs> I'm very interested in the subject. And I put together this presentation, this workshop that I'll be giving at Conscious Life Expo in LA, putting out all the evidence about how not only uh, giants had been found in North America, but also how you can find them on hieroglyphics in Egypt and many other cultures around the world, that it truly was a global phenomenon. And those bones have been found in five of the seven continents around the world too. Wow, and what is your perspective on the giants and perhaps maybe how they originated? And also, why do you feel that that is being covered up? Well, it's being covered up because I feel like it just rewrites history in a way that a lot of the historians don't want to address, that there was another sentient, perhaps even higher intelligent species on this planet before humans. And so that kind of uh, throws many of our organized religion narratives into a tizzy to say that, hey, well, maybe humans aren't the top of the totem pole here, that there were others involved. And when I went down to South America five years before the Antarctica trip, we were traveling through the sacred valley of Peru. You can go to museums where they have these elongated skulls on display. Certain people like the Peruvians, there's even a, another museum in Paracas, Peru, where they have dozens of these giant skulls and they're much, much bigger than humans. And I'll show in my presentation the size comparison of human skulls and some of these elongateds. But down there in Peru, they're just, hey, this is part of our history. This is who we are. This is another uh, species that lived amongst us. And, and many times they're even buried in the royal tombs of the Incans. So they held a very high place in society uh, when they existed, coexisted with, with human beings, with the Incans and other races. 
Wonderful. And have you found, um, I guess my next question is, where else in the world have you found um, other giants or elongated skulls? Well, they're, they're on five of the seven continents. So the other continents would be Africa, uh, down in Ethiopia. There was a very famous dig about 20 years ago. I'll show some pictures of that. Ginormous heads. I mean, much, much bigger than the ones found in some of our mound sites here in North America. And oftentimes, the older they are, the more peculiar they are. For example, some of them will have double rows of teeth. Some of them will have an extra digit on their hand and toes. And they also, if they're very, very old, sometimes when they're uncovered, just touching them makes them turn to dust. That's how old they are. So so a lot of these uh, digs, they'll be in mine shafts or uh, other kind of digs and come across a, a tomb. And once they, they open it up and try to lift up a bone, it just disintegrates. So some of, some of the digs are lost that way. But they've also found the elongated skulls in Europe on the Black Sea area, quite a few, and also out in uh, China and the Far East. The only continents that I'm aware of that ha have not found any giants is Australia and Antarctica, but otherwise all around the world. So clearly demonstrating that this was a worldwide culture and perhaps they had a connection amongst themselves. Perhaps they were flying the Vimana craft that are described in the ancient Indian texts, that there was a high-tech civilization that once existed in this world. And perhaps they were just colonies of a, a master civilization that had once been here. And humans, as described by uh, Zachariah Sitchin, were just the worker race that we were even developed perhaps by these genetic scientists, uh, uh, the giants, to mine the gold for them, to be smart enough to take orders, but dumb enough not to realize that uh, we didn't have to follow these masters. And it's kind of funny with the um, with some of these biblical texts and, and uh, Zachariah Shitchin finding that... Uh, that they were indeed a created race. And my colleague, Michael Tellinger down in South Africa, he's found dozens of ancient gold mines, sometimes even with the uh, tools used to uh, find the gold. And, and so the emerging theory here is that humans were, were genetically created, were uh, mastered by these giants and we were told that they were our lords and masters. And isn't it funny how the word Lord comes up so much? We have our landlords, we have a, the Lord in heaven that we pray to, and these lords seem to be these giants who uh, mastered genetic science and created this human race. Because indeed, now that we look into our own genome, we can find that humans have 22 different genetic sequences in our own DNA, including reptilian, right in the back of our head, right where the spine reaches the skull is the reptilian brain. That is the fight or flight mechanism. So there's many things about humans that are still not quite fully understood. And part of that is how we may be the genetic progeny of these giant uh, genetic master race that were here on this earth a long, long time ago. And uh, there is even still some evidence that they're here to this day. And I'll show you in my uh, presentation, some photographs of elongated humans, or perhaps they're a type of hybrid that are still alive to this day. So the story continues. Yes, that is fascinating. Thank you for sharing that with, with us. And that is going to be The Giants in Prehistory and the Mystery of the Megaliths with Brad Olson, Sunday, February 11th at 10 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. And I guess, please share with us your experiences on different television shows. Sure, yeah, I've been on a half a dozen regular mainstream television show, including couple episodes of ancient aliens 
when I was talking about auditive levitation and the new emerging science of how uh, matching the resonant frequency of a certain block, say, for example, the megaliths. And, and this is part of the mystery of the megaliths is how they were able to move these giant blocks. Now science is finally playing catch up and finding that every one of us and every physical thing in this world has a resonant frequency. And if you're able to match the frequency using technology that is only now emerging, or shall I say re-emerging, because I do believe it had been employed in times of past, that you would be able to move these megalithic stones. And so the ep one episode of Ancient Aliens I was on, we were talking about the location called Non Madal in Micronesia. And there is a quarry where these basalt, kind of like Lincoln log rocks were taken from one side of the island, moved over a waterway to the backside of Ponape where they created this very enigmatic site called Non Madal. And it, when it was first discovered by explorers, they called it the Venice of the Pacific. It's still there to this day. And Ancient Aliens has done subsequent shows just on Non Madal because it's so unique. And of course, underwater, um, Graham Hancock covers this in his show, Ancient Apocalypse there's even underwater features. So it looks like non Madal is very, very old when it was constructed and uh, had used and employed this technique of auditive levitation, of, of being able to lift very heavy objects and move them even over water to their destination. I've been on other shows like uh, <clears throat> on... America Unearthed with Scott Walter. We were talking about the Wavanzi Stone in uh, Chicago, um, Book of Secrets and Beyond Belief with uh, George Noria. A couple episodes of that have appeared on. In one of those episodes, we talked about the giants. So it's very uh, familiar territory for people who are uh, into these subjects that I might pop up here and there talking about the giants or megaliths and uh, perhaps the connection between the two, that maybe this is another lost technology that the uh, these very advanced giant race were using to build these megaliths. So I'll put all that, those connections together in my talk at the Conscious Life Expo in LA and hope to see you and uh, your audience in the uh, audience for my presentation. And, and I think the takeaway will be that um, here we have evidence for a giant race and lost technology that could have been used to build uh, these megalithic structures, which is also a worldwide phenomenon on five of the seven continents. You can find giant megalithic rock work uh, of a builder race, which I call it uh, usually of this polygonal architecture of many different angles, but so precisely fitted together, which is another great mystery of how these megaliths were formed and put together so precisely and are still there to this very day for us to to go there and check it out. Yes. And so just real quick, what is a megalithic construction and what do you believe those were used for? Hmm. Well, megaliths just mean very, very large. Another word for it is cyclopean which come out of uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey by Homer, where the giant Cyclops was this giant that uh, lived near Sicily. And they were going there to find the golden fleece, but they had to get by the Cyclops. And he had the one eye, you know, which could be representative of the third eye too. And uh, they had to get by the giant to get to the golden fleece in which they were after. So the, the, the megaliths found around the world just means very, very large stones that had been cut from a quarry and transported to a site and then expertly put together. This is one of the great enigmas of planet Earth is how these megalithic structures could have been built. And some of them are so large, like the site at Belbak in Lebanon, there's not a crane in the world today that could have moved some of these stones, which are fitted in the base of this temple 
in Baalbek, Lebanon. Similarly, in Sacsayhuaman in Peru, you have megalithic block work that is put together so precisely that there wouldn't be an engineering company in the world today that could do it. In fact, the uh, Japanese tried to build a smaller replica of the Great Pyramid using modern building techniques. They couldn't even complete it. It was so difficult to do. So there's just so many mysteries surrounding these megalithic constructions. Of course, I do other talks on this subject at conferences, but I'll weave it into the giant talk as well, just to give people an overview of some of the technology that was used to build these megalithic structures. Wonderful. And thank you for sharing that with everybody. And um, I know that we are going to be looking forward to your workshop. And again, that is the giants in prehistory and the mystery of the megaliths with Brad Olson and giants in prehistory. So that's Sunday, February 11th at 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. And so what do you feel as we go forward and evolve as humans and on this timeline that we're currently in, how do you feel that disclosing our history, how do you feel that this is gonna help with our consciousness as we expand? Mm. Well, like the old saying, knowledge is power. And the more you know, the more empowered you become. And to know our suppressed human origins, to me, is an absolutely fundamental piece of the puzzle of who we are on this planet. Uh, even though I will propose that many of these giants were not human, they were human-like, but they're not quite human like we are. For example, they don't have the uh, central suture, that crack, if you see a human skull that goes up in our forehead. The giants don't have that. Uh, as well as many other features, as I described earlier. So they're they're a different cut of the same dye, you could say, or we are a product of their genetic tinkering, as Zachariah Sitchin would say. So it's really a, a big piece of the puzzle that is placed when you incorporate this information into the whole timeline of human beings on planet earth. It's really an essential part of the big question of who are we and why are we here? And once you understand this, the knowledge is your power, uh, you do come to a much better understanding of our place in this world and maybe even how everything is set up uh, with the with these lords having the, the greater run of the show here on planet earth. And so, once we start to understand who and what they are, maybe we have a better understanding of how we can perhaps free ourselves from uh, the yoke of this oppression. And, and that's what the subtitle of my book, Beyond Esoteric, Escaping Prison Planet's all about, is just knowing thyself and who we are in the world today. And that's what I primarily uh, focus on in this book. So. Yeah, if, if your listeners would uh, pick up a copy and they find it worthy of Book of the Year, yeah, that would be great if uh, could vote for this book as well. Yes, we will have that link for the book awards. Anyone can go there and vote for Brad's book. And please share with us your website um, and what we can find there. Sure, well, to find Beyond Esoteric, all of my books, as well as uh, the dozen authors who I publish at cccpublishing.com. You can go to that website. And if you order any of my books, uh, they go through my office and I'm able to sign copies for people. The other website is my name, Brad Olson, O-L-S-E-N, spelled as one, one word, dot com. And then you can see some of the other conferences I'll be speaking at in 2024 and some of the other projects I get involved with, uh, including event production of a big outdoor festival we do every springtime in San Francisco called the How Weird Street Fair. And we just submitted the paperwork to do our 25th annual How Weird Street Fair on May 4th in downtown San Francisco, California. So that's another event I'll be at, but it's kind of funny when I'm the producer I'm rarely seen, but when I'm the speaker, 
of other people's events, then I'm on stage with a microphone. So I kind of play both ends on that one. How exciting. And do you have any other expeditions coming up other than Asia? Well, I travel around the country quite a bit. So I'll be speaking at a conference in Texas in April for the full solar eclipse. That'll be cool. I went to the other solar eclipse uh, up in Idaho about seven years ago. It's really an amazing thing to see during the middle of the day and the sun gets blocked out by the moon. Perfect uh, synchronization where in the middle of the day, everything goes dark. You can even see the stars in the sky. But the interesting thing I observed when I was at the first solar eclipse is that along the horizon, it's still daylight. It's just up in the sky that everything turns dark. So looking forward to that one on April 9th, 10th, and 11th, the date of that uh, next solar eclipse, which I understand is the only one in North America for about another dozen years before the next one. So happy to go see that one again, too. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. Very interesting. And so are there any messages that you would like to share with anybody who will be looking forward and joining your workshop? Sure. Well, if you find uh, our ancient history of interest, I should be able to shed some perspective on uh, more of that uh, untold history that uh, has been withheld from us. And just in general, it's the Great Awakening. We're in the, a period where humans have had unprecedented access to information and knowledge that we have a new conscious life amongst us. And putting all these pieces together makes us better, more intelligent humans. So just be part of the Great Awakening and, and uh, expand your knowledge horizon as much as you can. And in the end, we're all in this together. We're watching the greatest show that's ever taken place here on planet Earth. It's great to to see it all and, and play my role in it and everybody else. So we'll see you at the Conscious Life Expo and uh, looking forward to a great 2024. Yes, amazingly said. And so if anybody would like to find Brad, book beyond esoteric escaping prison planet you can vote for that on the conscious life expo website and i will be posting that link for everyone there and just as another reminder the giants in prehistory is sunday february 11th at 10 a.m to 11 a.m and that is a keynote workshop with brad is there any social media that you would like to share with anyone to contact. Oh, just uh, you can find me, Brad Olson, uh, on Facebook uh, and also Twitter. Those are about the only ones I do. CCC Publishing on Twitter and uh, do my posts there. And yeah, just share a lot of funny, interesting stuff. And uh, the where is he now <laughs> photos when I'm on my travels and let people uh, travel vicariously through uh, my trips. Try to do a funny shot somewhere wherever I'm at. Yes, wonderful. And I can just imagine how inspirational that your, your travels are to many. And so thank you for doing that and sharing your work with us. My pleasure. Happy to be here. Yes. Be in service to all. <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, thank you, everybody. And Brad, is there anything else that you would like to share with us before we before we go today? Well, just hope to uh, see some people come out to the Conscious Life Expo in LA in February. I'll have some of my books uh, after my talk. And I like meeting people. So come on over and say hello. Yes, we will get all of that information for everyone in the description, including the workshop, the book awards and Brad's website and his publishing website if anyone is interested in any more information. And so 
Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Brad, so much for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you at the Expo in February. And I know many, many, many more will be coming to see you and your workshop. So thank you very much. Well, you're very welcome.